on today's Palace of Pistons podcast, which Pistons most likely to break out? Which one's most likely to have the most disappointing season? We're going to talk about all that and a little bit more on this short edition of the Palace of Pistons podcast. Let's do it. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another exciting night of NBA basketball. The Pistons are digging in. They got the depth. They got the big men. They got the better basketball team. No doubt about it. Pistons need a three, and they have just under three seconds to do it. Here's Chauncey Phillips. Here it is. Welcome back to the Palace of Pistons podcast, everyone. It's just me. It's just Aaron running the show this week, doing a solo episode. I know we didn't have a podcast last week and wanted to make sure that we brought you guys some content this week. In the doldrums of the offseason, I think the the biggest news that we have gotten this week for the Pistons is that the Motor City Crews made a trade and sent away one of my co-hosts, all-time favorite players. He considers him one of the legends of the game, but the crews traded away uh, one of Troy Weaver's projects, Buddy Beheim, uh, as part of a 14 deal in the G League. Uh, but that's all just joking around. I uh, miss you, Jasper. No Jasper this week, no Mike this week. Hopefully the guys will be back with me next week. But still going to bring you a show this week, and got a very interesting topic to talk about before we start discussing it i want to give you a quick word about our sponsor as always it's bet online bet online is the world's most trusted betting platform and your number one source for everything football bet online has every stat every matchup and even live odds and spreads to bet on during the game think you know your stuff get in on our two hundred thousand dollar mega contest and pick five games against the spread every week for your chance to win at weekly prizes and a share of 200 k When the game's over, head on over to our online casino and get in on a game of blackjack or poker or unwind with one of our 150 slot games. Head to the website today to get in on the action. Bet online where the game starts. Okay, very interesting topic this week. You know, no real news to talk about. There's no real rumors going on with the Pistons outside of Uh, who their starting center may or may not be dating. Uh, So we're going to talk about a topic that I think will be divisive. And we're talking about what Piston is most likely to have a breakout season and which Piston is most likely to disappoint this season. I want to start with what players most likely to break out. And I want to first discuss, I will talk about two players here because you're used to getting at least two perspectives on the show. Uh, sometimes three. Today, you're still going to get two. I want to talk about the player that I think is most likely to have his breakout campaign, and that's Cade Cunningham. Going into his fourth season in the league, uh, coming up into the season after just signing a rookie max contract extension, and you're talking about a player that last year, 62 games, just under 23 points a game, seven and a half assists, over four rebounds, 45% from the field, 35.5% from the three-point line, uh, was playing very good basketball, especially down the stretch before he essentially got shut down for the year. And you're now talking about putting him on a roster that has spent an offseason putting better pieces around him not just in terms of overall talent, but in terms of fit around Cunningham, prioritizing experience, prioritizing shooting, prioritizing scoring, prioritizing some size, some wings. Uh, they've added defend defenders, like a much better team around Cunningham as the floor general. It's going to elevate his game and allow him to elevate this team's overall game, which I think is why he's the best candidate to pick for which Piston is most likely to break out. He's already shown 
he is a really good NBA player. But can he break out to the point where he's in the all-star discussion? The East has a lot of talented guards. Off the top of my head, thinking of some guys that maybe didn't make the all-star game last year that he's competing with, guys like LaMelo Ball, Trey Young. Thinking of some guys that are all-star level guards, Tyrese Maxey. There's there's just there's just a number of high level guards that he has to compete with. But can he make that jump into that discussion? I don't think he was in it last year. I think the Pistons were so bad. I think he played better post All Star break than he did pre All Star break. But the way he ended last year with the talent that he has around him this year, there's going to be a jump in his game. I think his numbers should improve. And you should just you you should see him play better basketball on a team that's playing better basketball. So I think he can take that leap. This is his this is his year to take that next step. And when we talk about breaking out, you know, Cade's obviously not a guy coming off the bench, getting his first chance to start, uh, and getting to play 30 minutes a night for the first time in his career. Like he's been there, he's done that, but this is his chance to break out into being an all-star level player. A, a top 25 player in the league, a top 30 player in the league, a chance to be talked about as part of that next group of stars in the NBA, a discussion that I think Cunningham has found himself left out of considering he missed the large majority of his sophomore season and then last year played for one of the worst teams in league history in, let's face it, a smaller market in NBA terms. So this upcoming season, a big one for Cunningham, a big one for the Pistons, but I think a true chance for him to break out. And if he does, the Pistons will be much, much better off for it, both in the short term and in the long term. But what does he need to do to break out? Can he have the signature moments down the stretch in closer games? The Pistons didn't play a a lot of competitive close games last year that they were really going to win and then when they did play close competitive games they lost them can Cunningham be that guy down the stretch I think that was a discussion dating back all the way to his rookie year really is is he a guy you can give the ball to late in the game and last year we saw him have his struggles there last year we saw the the turnovers or the bad shot the shot that doesn't just go in And if he's a different player this time around and he doesn't turn the ball over, doesn't make the the, the wrong read, gets the good shot or finds the open teammate and they hit the shot, I think that's one way that you get him in that that discussion of a breakout player, at least in terms of the national eye. If you're seeing the Pistons not just sitting at 14th or 15th in the standings, 10 games below 500 by the end of November, you're talking about Cade and this team in a different light. And that gives Cunningham an opportunity to play in those bigger moments, you know, and, and, and make a bigger impact for those that are maybe watching. So I think Cade's the, my number one choice here. The second player I'll talk about, I think it has to be one of Jalen Duran or Jaden Ivy. And for this sake, I'll, I'll go with Jalen Duran here. Um, you look at the numbers and you see production. 14 points, 12 rebounds last year, 62% from the field, you know, two blocks a game, or excuse me, one block a game, one block a game. Wow. That's crazy that Duran as a 6'11 center had less than less than a block per game last year. Like, but that's something we're going to talk about. But you look at the numbers and you see production. You see a young 20-year-old that physically dominates the game on at times in, inside. On the other end, you don't just look at the box scores and you don't just look at, you know, basketball reference or whatever stats page you get your stats from. You saw a player last year wasn't really all there. And at least in my mind was disappointing. We've seen production at the center spot in Detroit for years. Andre Drummond was great at putting up double doubles, big numbers on the glass. Those, those highlight dunks, like he was great at that. But you know what? Drummond caught a lot of flack during his tenure in Detroit 
for his defense, for not being able to contribute to a winning team, to make winning plays. Jalen Duren's only 20, so it's not necessarily fair to put all of that on him right now. But hell, I remember having these very same discussions about Andre Drummond at this very st- same stage for him in his career with the Pistons. Jalen Duren has to take a step forward, needs to take a step forward in a year that sets him up to go into an offseason where he's eligible for a rookie contract extension. It's a big year under a new regime, a regime that reportedly, at least from one source that, that came out, I can't remember who reported it, but there was someone that came out, a reporter around the league that said, Trejan Langdon maybe isn't convinced Jalen Duran is the center of the future for the Pistons. So he's playing for a new general manager who may or may not believe he's the center of the future. He's playing for a new coach in J.B. Bickerstaff. There's pressure on him to take a serious step forward. And for Duran, that starts on the defensive end. I think when I read the stats over again, as I introduced him to this topic, 0.8 0.8 blocks per game, 20 years old, 6'11". That's, that shouldn't be possible for the role Duran has on this team, for the respect and the regard he's held to in terms of being such a prominent part of this team's future and their, as part of their core. He cannot be a negative defender he cannot negatively impact the game for them on the defensive side of the floor and he did last year he did not contribute positively taking plays off getting himself in foul trouble and having to come out of games because he's making taking bad fouls that can't happen the lack of energy uh, the lack of hustle the lack of basketball iq He has to be a huge part of this team, and he has to be a huge part of this team defensively. He has to be somewhat of an anchor for this team defensively. You look at their potential starting lineup. Cade Cunningham, it's one of Malik Beasley or Jaden Ivey. It's either Asar Thompson or Simone Fantecchio, Tobias Harris, Jalen Dern. Where are the defenders in that group? Where are the above-average defenders in that group? Asar Thompson, if he's in the starting lineup, gives you one. Malik Beasley's average. Ivy's not a uh, regarded defender. I think Cade Cunningham can give you moments where he looks really good defensively. Hasn't proven he's there uh, consistently as a really good defender. Same can be said for Tobias Harris. Can hold his own, but not a guy you build a defense around. And the same is said for Simone Fantecchio. So you need... Someone to be your anchor defensively, protect you down low, protect the rim. Traditionally, that's your center. Traditionally, it's a player that has the physical build and attributes that Jalen Duran has. We know he can put up big numbers offensively. We know he can put up big numbers on the glass on both sides of the court. But if he's going to break out, if he's going to turn into that Bam at a bio level center, where he's in all-star discussions, where he's a part of the Team USA roster. He's got to take a major, major leap defensively. Yes, he needs better players around him. Yes, he needs guards that can play defense on the perimeter. I think last year in in, in endurance rookie season, it was just a conga line to the rim. Is oh, Who coined that term? Was it Greg Kelser? But the point being, this team has to be better defensively because they set Jalen Duren up poorly night in and night out when he's out there because they're they're giving up so much pressure at the rim and Jalen Dern's not going to be able to make every one of those plays that's fair and that's understandable but he has to be better than he was in his sophomore season under a new coaching staff a new regime I hope there's some growth there and if there is and he continues to make strides overall coming off a year where he spent another summer working with Team USA as part of their select team I really think Jalen Dern could break out in his year three i'll also say on the flip side if there's a player most likely to disappoint for the pistons this year it's jalen Duran. 
you're talking about a guy that is being discussed as the second most important piece of this Pistons core. There's a lot of pressure on him, and you look at the numbers that he puts up, and you think he's this this you know phenomenal player just looking at the box score. But for the same reasons that I just discussed, he's very much not a complete player. And if he doesn't take a leap, you're going into an offseason where he's due for a contract extension, and you're wondering what to do with him. Because if Jalen Duran comes out and has a similar season as to what he did in year two, are you giving him a max contract extension, something I'm sure that's on his mind? Are you willing to commit well over a hundred million dollars to him long term. I don't know if I would be if he has a similar year to what he did last year. The numbers are great, and yes, he's young and he'll still be young after this year. I mean, he'll be 21 in his third season in the league, came into the league as the youngest player uh in the league. But I don't know if I'd be comfortable committing that kind of money to him if he doesn't take a leap this year. And what tells you that he's going to is my question. What tells you that he's going to become a better defender this year? Is it the coaching staff? Is it the fact that they brought in J.B. Bickerstaff, who just worked with two very skilled, talented big men in Cleveland, and both Evan Mobley and Jared Allen? Does that sell you on him being able to connect with Jalen Duran? and help him be the defensive anchor that he needs to be for this team? Is it the fact that maybe Duran was mailing it in last year after he realized the Pistons were a disaster and not capable of winning ballgame? And he was playing for a coach that clearly didn't know what he was doing with with his roster. And and maybe this this upcoming year, it's just going to be a different version. He's going to be more, quote-unquote, locked in, and you're going to see him making those big-time plays at the rim defensively that he should be capable of. That's my biggest question. Because I like what he's done offensively. I think he's taken steps offensively in his first two seasons. I think last year he showed some really nice passing abilities, even if at times they resulted in turnovers. His willingness to try to make a read, I think, is respectable. I think there's some stuff they can do with him in sort of that what was it, 2017, 2018, 2019 version of Andre Drummond that was operating at the free throw line, doing a lot of dribble handoff actions. Like, I think that's something they could look to a little bit with Duran because he's shown he has the ability on that side of the court to make plays not just for himself, but for others. But he has to be better defensively. And I don't know if it's a, some sort of guarantee or lock that it's going to happen just because he's going to be another year older and he's more experienced. Now, I, I, I know he came out and he said, you know, he knows he has to be better on that side of the court and he's going to be better on that side of the court. That's great. I got to see it to believe it. And if he doesn't take that step, I think he'll be the most disappointing because the Pistons, just when you look at their roster, and this is more on the previous regime than it is this new current one, but they built this team with Jalen Duran as a key, key cornerstone piece or alongside Kate Cunningham. And if he doesn't take a step forward this year, you're questioning a significant, significant factor in your core. And and, and that makes uh, next offseason a very interesting one in that regard. I'll talk about one other player here that I think is due to disappoint this year. And I I, I think we've kind of talked about it a few times uh, throughout this offseason, mostly after Summer League. But that's Marcus Sasser. it goes back to how he looked in summer league and it really goes back to how he looked last year with Detroit. You know, he had a stretch where he couldn't miss was on fire from the outside, but then he had a stretch where he couldn't hit a shot to save his life. And you were hoping you would see him come into summer league in July and really lead that team and be the floor general and, and, and be the number one guard and get everyone organized and be able to show he can run an offense because he drafted him to be a point guard. At least Troy Weaver did when he selected him. And I didn't come out of summer league thinking he looked too much like a point guard. He looked like a six-foot shooting guard. There's not too many of those in the NBA. 
And there's a lot of guards. There's a lot of two threes on Detroit's roster already. It's going to make it really hard for Marcus Sasser to play any sort of role like that. So if he does get minutes at point guard, I just don't know if we've seen anything that says he's capable of doing that. Uh, he didn't look comfortable at, at the point guard spot in summer league. In fact, uh, the Pistons two-way player, Dennis Jenkins, who they signed as an undrafted free agent following draft, the draft, looked more comfortable at the point guard spot, product from St. John's, and he looked like a really intriguing player. So I just think we're set to see, unfortunately for Marcus Sasser, a number one pick by this past regime, I just don't think he's set up for success because there's not a role for him to play as an off-ball guard. And I just, unless there's a ton of injuries and they can get him out there and line up with Cunningham and, and Thompson and, and, and whatever other, you know, defenders this roster has and try to hide him. I, I just don't know where he fits into this team. Unfortunately, unless he takes some significant leap and looks like a completely different player than he did in summer league. I, I just don't know where he fits in. And I think that's going to end up being a disappointment considering just one off season go, you gave up assets to move up and get him again, a previous regime. And I get that, but the people watching the Pistons have been watching them for many regimes before Troy Weaver. So that's not going to change their feelings and hoping he would be a good player for, for this ball club. I just don't know if he has what it takes uh, after what I saw in summer league. But I'm curious, what does everyone else think? Who is the Piston most likely to break out? Who is the Piston most likely to disappoint? I think you can make a case for Isaiah Stewart, maybe both ways. Maybe Isaiah Stewart flourishes as this Nas Reed-type sixth man off the bench for Detroit. Maybe he just becomes this hyper-electric backup big, or maybe he doesn't really have a role on this team anymore. And this new coaching staff and this new front office don't view him as a starting four anymore. Don't think he can play alongside Jalen Duran, and aren't really comfortable giving him the center spot uh, off the bench because he's only six, eight, six, nine. So I think you can make a case either way. I'm interested to see what everyone else has to say. You know, I think there's certainly talk for Jaden Ivy again, you could say both ways with these a lot of these guys. I don't think we're at that point with Asar Thompson yet, uh, one way or the other. I don't know if he's set up for a breakout year. Just you know, it's not. I don't. I don't think he's going to be asked to do anything to the point where he, you know, quote unquote, breaks out. I think his role is going to be pretty defined. You need to play defense. You need to help on the glass. You need to finish at the rim and give an opportunities to. Um, and I don't necessarily know if he disappoints this year because. We know where he's at offensively. We know he was a project when he was drafted offensively. The offensive game was really, really raw. The ball handling, the shooting, the scoring, even the finishing, you know, off the dribble at the rim. Unless he's dunking it, where's the finishing? We know all that's raw. So I don't really know if there's a way that he disappoints unless he just cannot put the ball in the basket at any level. But I don't think we're there yet with him. So I'm curious what everyone else thinks in that regard. You know, we're sitting here in September. We're a month away from Piston basketball, a month away from everything starting. Uh, you get media day, you get training camps, you get preseason. The schedule came out a few weeks ago. We did a whole podcast breaking down the schedule. If you haven't watched that, if you haven't listened to that yet, go check it out. It's on whatever platform that you're watching or listening to the show from right now. What's everyone think? Uh, we haven't seen another move made by the Pistons. They've held this open roster spot for, uh, you know, quite some time now. They've been at 14 for a while. Figured there was a move coming down the pipeline. It hasn't happened yet. I think the Larry Markkinen uh, contract situation was where everyone was eyeing, including myself. I thought they were going to make as a good third team in a deal there to absorb a contract or something, which with whichever team moved, uh, moved to get Markkinen. But nothing's happened yet. And so do we think the Pistons are eyeing a free agent? That's something that I wrote about a few weeks ago on palaceofpistons.com. I wrote about some available free agents that the Pistons uh, could look to sign, considering to have the open roster spot. Talked about a few names, including former Piston Dennis Smith Jr. as a guard. Let me know what you think there. Or do you think they might just go into the season with 14 and see what happens? See, see what types of trades 
become available once the season gets going. Maybe a team starts off a little slower, gets desperate, and, and, and decides to make a big trade, and the Pistons can wiggle themselves into that deal somehow. What do we think Trajan Langdon has going on? Because I think what we have seen from this uh, regime, much different than the past one, is that there's no sitting on hands here and just waiting and seeing uh, if if the guys that they drafted are going to pan out and, and all turn into – superstars like th- this is a, a regime that's focused on building this team and not just doing so through one avenue so they're definitely active and working what might they be working on i'm curious what everyone thinks there so i know this is a shorter edition of the palace of pistons podcast uh unfortunately we're just at that point in the off season there's not a whole lot going on right now uh, there's no real news Uh, There's no real rumors. There's no real reports. And there's just no basketball to talk about uh, at at this point. So what I would like to know is what do you guys want us to talk about the rest of the offseason? We've really got probably about another two to three shows before there's something newsworthy uh, in terms of what's going on with the Pistons at that point in time to talk about. We've got breakdowns coming on palaceofpistons.com, our Substack. If you haven't gone there and subscribed, it's free. It takes all of 20 seconds, and it helps us tremendously. But we've got breakdowns coming of each uh, spot on the Pistons roster, breaking down the guard rotation, the wing rotation, the bigs rotation. Our staff is working on those right now, and we're going to have those rolling out here very, very soon. But what do you want us to talk about on the show? What other topics should we get into you know, we've talked about the starting lineup. We've talked about the bench unit. Uh, Mike did a, a solo podcast where he talked about what he'd seen from J.B. Bickerstaff in Cleveland and what he thinks he's going to bring to Detroit. So we've done a lot of different topics. We've discussed a lot of different things. I if you haven't listened to those shows or watched them. I highly suggest you go back and do so. But if you have something that we haven't talked about yet, tell us. Let us know. Tweet us. Respond in the comments on YouTube. Tell us what you want us to talk about. Give us something that you think is interesting uh, to hear discussed, and we will certainly do it. I'm excited for basketball to be back. I am more excited uh, and more intrigued to see what the Pistons look like this year than I have the past few years. I think this is just probably the best roster overall that they've had uh, since Kate Cunningham's rookie season when they brought in Jeremy Grant and had Mason Plumlee. Um I just think they have, and this doesn't say a lot because it's still not a playoff team, but they have the most talent that they've had since Kate Cunningham was drafted to the Pistons. So I'm interested to see what this team looks like. And I think this is a big year ahead for Cunningham in terms of cementing himself as one of the league's cornerstone players. So let me know what you guys think. Who's the Piston most likely to break out? Who's the Piston most likely to disappoint? But that's going to do it for this short edition of the Palace of Pistons podcast. Thanks so much for tuning in. We greatly, greatly appreciate your support. Make sure to check out our sponsor, Bet Online. As always, they continue to support us every week. Great, very grateful to them. That's going to do it for this week's edition of the Palace of Pistons podcast. Good week, everyone. And we'll see you next time for another edition of the Palace of Pistons podcast.